The emergency in Attawapiskat, how a First Nations community is coping. No electricity to this house then. And sticking up for the little guys, Ultimate Fighters join the campaign to end bullying. Me fighting is, has, and bullying are two very, very different things. All that and more on a special edition of Humber News. Hello and welcome to Humber News coming to you from the Broadcast Center at the North Campus. I'm Tom Kituku. Thank you for joining us. And I'm Caitlin DeCary. This semester, our show started with no control room and no studio, as support staff went on an 18-day strike. But we still managed to report stories on the issues affecting you. From the provincial election to a Humber student's murder trial to Occupy Toronto, Humber News was there. Today, we take an in-depth look at the issues that are still making headlines, as well as a few stories to get you in the holiday spirit. But first, Tom has our top story. Our show begins with the ongoing crisis in Atawapiskat. It's been almost a month since the First Nations community declared a state of emergency. The Red Cross, along with the federal government, have intervened, but not the way reserve leaders had hoped. Summer Ismail investigates. The northern Ontario Aboriginal town of Atawapiskat is facing a terrible housing crisis. The horrific living conditions at Attawapiskat came to light when New Democratic MP Charlie Angus visited the community and took an this video. So there's no electricity to this house then? Just an extension. Just an extension from, from the house to the shack. These living conditions can have horrible health consequences, according to the Ontario Registered Nurses Lynn Ann Mulrooney. Um, some people have problems with skin conditions and skin infections and scabies, and, um, which is a little kind of parasite that um, is very itchy for people. The severity of the skin conditions and burns speak for themselves. A sense of self self -esteem for a child to be it's an international shame, really, that a country as wealthy as Canada isn't doing better so that everybody has an equal chance. It's, it's only fair. We all need an equal chance mm -hmm. in life. The black all mold. Black all mold. Yeah. The condition of the houses the is appalling. Mold, the black mold in the houses the puts people at risk of infection and, and disease. Humber's Aboriginal elder says this is not the first time that a crisis like Attawapiskat has happened in Canada. Uh, I think that it has been happening for a number of years in this country and unfortunately it takes the smaller communities like Attawapiskat to get uh, people to pay attention that these third world conditions are here alive and well in Ontario and in Canada. And no water? No, of course no water. No washroom. Director at the Canadian Red Cross, Tammy Elliott, spoke about what supplies are being sent to the community. We've uh, sent up sleeping bags and some heaters, and we're, we've also assessed other needs that will include generators, um, some things to help insulate homes, rugs, and other things to help people stay warm during the winter months. It's unknown how long the problem in Attawapiskat will continue, but it is clear from the people we spoke to that they are unhappy with the way the government is handling the situation. And until something is done, the people of Attawapiskat will continue to suffer. Summer Ismail, Humber News. Communities across the province are going to new lengths to end bullying. Following a string of teen suicides, the provincial government introduced anti-bullying le legislation in November. But an unexpected group is trying to ensure safe environments for young people. Mixed martial artists took off their gloves to address bullying at a UFC community works event at the Rogers Centre. Sarah Cresswell was there. Hundreds of kids from across Ontario came to the Rogers Centre to listen to what Ultimate Fighters had to say about bullying. UFC lightweight Sam Stout was the first fighter to take the stage. To me, fighting is, has, and bullying are two very, very different things. You know, um, I fight for the UFC. I train every day for it. I'm a professional. Um, the guys I'm fighting are willing participants. Sergeant Kevin Hooper represented the Toronto Police, who, with the support of the city, are making bullying a main priority on their agenda. The bullying is actually starting in junior kindergarten. 
these six-year-olds and four-and-a-half and five-year-olds may not know by definition what they're doing, but what they're actually engaged in is bullying and they're setting a very bad example for other kids because other kids are following them. After talking to the crowd, the UFC fighters invited the students to come down and meet them personally. The police and even the mayor are saying the best way to end bullying is to let someone know when it's going on. The City of Toronto and the Toronto Police Service will not tolerate bullying and we encourage students to come forward and report all incidents of bullying. UFC analyst Joe Ferraro says he was a victim of bullying growing up and was happy to see the tough guys saying it's not okay to harass anyone. Street. I'm glad I took martial arts because martial arts was my avenue to be safe. It taught me a lot of humility. It taught me to be humble. It taught me to respect my elders, respect authority. And I think it was important for these kids today, at, at, with, you know, they're at risk youth. The anti-bullying initiative is already working. Today at the event, a young boy reported to a police officer that he was being bullied. And before he even left the building, the police, along with school staff, were working to bring it to an end. Sarah Cresswell, Humber News. Gina Morrison was riding her bike to pick up her son from daycare last month when her life was cut short. Morrison, who was pregnant at the time, was pulled under a truck at an intersection in Toronto's West End. Now politicians and cycling advocates are demanding the federal government make side guards on trucks mandatory. Reporter Kathleen Finley has the story. Over a month after she was hit by a truck in the city's West End, Torontonians continue to mourn the death of Jenna Morrison. The pregnant yoga instructor was riding her bike to pick up her son when she was caught under the wheels of a truck. Her death has sparked renewed calls by the cycling community to make it safer for bikes and trucks to share the road. Andrea Garcia, director of advocacy and operations for the Toronto Cyclist Union says, Morrison's death has rallied the city's cyclists. It really has sort of served to uh, renew calls that have really been around since um, the 1990s uh, about the, the necessity to mandate uh, side guards on trucks. Toronto City Council overwhelmingly approved a motion to look into more safety measures for trucks. One of the most contentious is side guards. The metal panels line the sides of the truck and are meant to prevent cyclists and pedestrians from getting caught underneath the wheels. Councillor Glenn de Bearmaker introduced the motion last month and says side guards are necessary to prevent more tragedies from happening. There's 30,000 people a day in the summer in the city of Toronto and in the downtown core cycling to work every day and those 30,000 people need protection. This isn't the first time mandatory side guards have been proposed. Initiatives have been pushed at both the municipal and federal level over the last 20 years. Marco Baghetto of the Canadian Trucking Alliance says the proof side guards save lives just isn't there. We don't see that there's any evidence out there in all the literature available to suggest that uh, they are proven to prevent injuries or deaths. Um, all the available research either comes out um, inconclusive or actually says that they will not prevent any injuries or death. The Toronto Cyclists Union says the trucking industry isn't doing their homework. That's the one study they keep referencing. There's about 10 others that are conclusively say um, truck side guards saved lives. Proponents of the side guards say resistance from the trucking industry isn't surprising. But Rob Jackson, a 25-year trucking veteran, says this change could be a good thing. As far as I'm concerned, if it's going to save somebody from going underneath our vehicle in the accident, it's worth it. Although Toronto City Council moved a step closer to putting side guards on Toronto's trucks, the victory for cyclists might be hollow at best. With the federal government and the trucking industry largely on the same side, it might be some time before Canadians can expect to see mandatory truck side guards nationwide. For Humber News, I'm Kathleen Finley. People across the GTA may be looking forward to some spiked eggnog or a champagne toast to ring in the new year but they should also be thinking about how they'll get home. The risk of drinking and driving becomes a dangerous reality over the holiday season. Nicole Bogart took a look at the ride program and what the Toronto D police do to combat drunk driving. Hi, we're running ride tonight. Any alcohol to drink? Okay, have a good night. Toronto police have been lining the streets every night since the end of November with ride spot checks. 
337 officers have dedicated 829 hours to this year's holiday ride program so far. Officers are trained to recognize the signs of intoxication while speaking to drivers on the line. As Constable Steve Aguiar explains, there are both physical and conversational cues police use to determine if a driver should be breathalyzed. Um, bloodshot eyes, glossy eyes, sometimes a glazed look on people's faces, um, as well as just an overall tired uh, look on their face, droopy eyes, all that kind of stuff. When police suspect someone of drunk driving, they are asked to undergo a breath test, which takes place here in the mobile ride unit. The unit features two test rooms where blood alcohol content is measured. As Constable Wendy Johnston demonstrates, a driver must blow under 0 0.08 milligrams of alcohol per 100 milliliters of blood. Anything over 0 0.08 is an arrestable offense. Hi, we're running right tonight. Any alcohol to drink? 11 days into the holiday ride program, out of 369 drivers tested, 26 have been charged with criminal offenses. But, as Constable Johnston explains, there are many alternative ways to get home this season. Uh, there's cabs, there's buses, there's, there's so many alternatives, but once the deed's been done, uh, I mean, the worst thing that could happen is that you could kill someone. Mad Canada works closely with Toronto Police to raise awareness about drunk driving. Carolyn Swinson, victim services volunteer for Mad Toronto, cautions that drinking and driving deeply affects both the victim and the offender. I know from the times that I actually speak to offenders as a victim, and if you ask them, you know, why they why they chose to drive while they were impaired, the, the uh, odds are that they're going to tell you because it's because they thought they were going to get away with it. Toronto police have conducted over 85 ride spot checks so far this holiday season. Although only one in 38 drivers who have been pulled over have been drinking, there is a small increase in those who have been arrested for drinking and driving offenses. The message this year is to stay safe on the roads during the holidays. Nicole Bogart, Humber News. Mayor Rob Ford has pledged to cut city spending and it looks like he's following through. Arenas, libraries and cultural landmarks are not safe from Toronto's 2012 budget cuts. But rumours of four heritage museums going on the chopping block were quickly dismissed after a public outcry. Hannah van der Koy has more on how these museums were saved from getting axed. Four city-run museums have been spared from the long list of cuts in Toronto's 2012 budget. Last month, Councillor Joe Mihavik leaked that three historic museums, Montgomery's Inn, Gibson House, and Zion Schoolhouse, as well as Market Gallery, an exhibition space in St. Lawrence Market, could see closures next year. He says the museums are important to Toronto's history. Also, cities also have histories. They, have, they are the way they are because of the particular players and dynamics. And so we have an interesting story here in the city of Toronto. The city quickly rebuttaled that the heritage museums would remain open. The, Councillor the Jay Robinson was appointed spokeswoman for the issue and says that the closures were up for discussion based on attendance and financial performance. KPMG uh, were the consultants who actually put forward the core service review and in that uh, document it did actually state that they should look at closures for cost savings of low attended museums. The City of Toronto runs 10 historic museums in addition to Market Gallery at a cost of $5.3 million per year. The discussed closures of four of the museums were in an effort to save the city $1 million a year. Montgomery's Inn, Gibson House and Zion School House are brick buildings built in the 19th and early 20th century and are located on the outskirts of the city. They tell a story of Toronto before subdivisions and sky rises. It survived really almost by accident. Uh, into the 1980s when sort of people looked around and said, it's the last one-room schoolhouse in North York, as it was then. Some residents in the area appreciate the historical significance of the cultural sites and wouldn't want to see them closed. The heritage uh, and the history uh, of the early days of Toronto in this area uh, is important that it's kept for the future generations. Even though these historic sites will not be facing closures in the 2012 budget, the city is still looking for ways for the museums to become more self-sufficient. Hannah Vanderkoy, Humber News. After the break, Rada Taylor goes on what might be her last trip through the Canadian Air and Space Museum.